Today we're going to begin studying the book of Colossians. Colossians is one of four epistles of Paul that are usually called the prison epistles. The fact is Paul wrote more than these four while in prison, but these four were written while he was in his, usually what's referred to as his first Roman imprisonment. There was another during which he wrote the pastoral epistles, the books of Timothy and Titus, especially Second Timothy. We know Paul was in prison when he wrote that. But there were two imprisonments of Paul, it would appear, because in Second Timothy chapter 4, he mentions having been released from his first time standing before Nero, that he was acquitted and released, and yet he was later captured again and, and uh, spent his final days in prison until he was executed. It was during the first of these Roman imprisonments that Paul wrote the four books, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. The last two of those, Colossians and Philemon, were both written to the same church because Philemon was a, a man, a leader, in the church of Colossae. And, of course, the book of Colossians uh, is, is addressed to that church as well. Colossae was a city in Asia Minor that was in a, what's called the Lycus Valley, the Lycus River, ran through this region. And there were three cities in the same general vicinity, there were, across the river from one another, the cities of Hierapolis and Laodicea. These cities were about six miles apart from each other, and they could see each other across the river. And to the north of there, about 12 miles, was the city of Colossae. And these were the three cities of the Lycus Valley. And um, we know there were at least 10 churches in Asia Minor about this time. We find, for example, in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, that seven letters are addressed to seven churches in this very region. Uh, we've got Ephesus and Thyatira and Pergamum and Sardis and, and Smyrna and Philadelphia and Laodicea. Um, we know that when Revelation was written, there were seven churches, at least, that were addressed there, but there were three other churches not mentioned in Revelation. And two of them were right here in the Lycus Valley. One was Colossae, <coughs> and the other was Hierapolis, although Laodicea, which was also in the Lycus Valley, was mentioned in Revelation. And as you know, it was the church that was said to be lukewarm. Um, Colossae did not receive a, a letter from Jesus in the book of Revelation. It's not clear exactly why uh, the book was written to only seven of the ten known churches in, that, in Asia. Asia is what we would now call uh, Turkey. When we say Asia in the Bible, we're talking about proconsular Asia, which is a, a, a region that the Roman Empire had called Asia. And it was really roughly the same borders as we would have for the modern country of Turkey. Uh, today, none of these churches are there. Colossae, in its time, was the least important city in the Lycus Valley. Laodicea was a very wealthy city. Hierapolis was a politically important city. Colossae had nothing particularly <coughs> interesting about it. It was of the three cities the least important. In fact, some scholars have said it was the least important city to which Paul ever wrote a letter. And yet, what he wrote to the church there in that city is one of the letters of the highest um, caliber. Many people have thought of Ephesus, or the book of Ephesians, I should say, as the loftiest of Paul's epistles. And if that is so, then Colossians would have to be very near the top of that uh, continuum also. Colossians and Ephesians are quite obviously twin epistles. Or, well, a twin is not exactly right. They're not identical twins. But they certainly complement each other. They were written at the same time. They're both part of the prison epistles written during Paul's first imprisonment. There are so many subjects in common between the two epistles, Ephesians and Colossians, that some have said they can find as many as 78 verses that are shared between the two. Not verbatim, but where the substance of the verses is essentially the same in Ephesians and in Colossians. As many as 78 verses have been identified as <coughs> being essentially the same. The flow of thought is very similar after a certain point. Uh, there are, uh, as we go through Colossians, we'll see many occasions to cross-reference back to Ephesians. But there is a signal difference between Ephesians and Colossians in these two letters, 
although they're, they're both sent to the churches of Asia. By the way, Ephesus was not very close to Colossae. It was about 100 miles away. But the Ephesian epistle emphasizes the church, the body of Christ. Whereas the Colossian epistle emphasizes Christ, the head of the church. Obviously, those are twin concepts. The church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Uh, anyone can tell who reads carefully that Ephesians is all about the church and its role as the body of Christ. And as you read Colossians, you'll find that it's not about the church. It's about Christ, who is emphatically said to be the head of the church. So we have both sides of this issue of who Christ is in relation to the church and who the church is in relationship to Christ when we see these two epistles. So they complement each other and they have much in common with each other. One thing uh, about Colossians that would appear to be unusual is that it was a letter written to people that Paul had never met. Well, he knew some of the people in the church, but he had apparently not met them in Colossae. He knew Philemon, it would appear. <clears throat> he knew Onesimus. Of course, he had met Onesimus and led him to the Lord while he, Paul, was in prison in Rome. Uh, there was a man named Epaphras, or Epaphras. The pronunciation of his name I'm not certain about. We'll just call him Epaphras. Uh, Epaphras was a man of Colossae, and he had somehow come into contact with Paul and been converted <coughs> and had himself become apparently the agent of converting Christians in Colossae because Paul speaks as if he has never been to this church. In Colossians 1.7, uh, after he has mentioned, well, 1, 7 and 8, we could say, he says, As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. That is to say, Paul had heard about this church and its love from Epaphras. Likewise, in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Most scholars understand this to mean that the church in Colossae and the church in Laodicea were among those who had never seen Paul in the flesh. He'd never been there. And so it would appear that while Paul had never been to Colossae, they had been evangelized by one of Paul's converts, Epaphras. Now, how Paul and Epaphras came to meet, we are never told. But we do read in the 19th chapter of Acts that when Paul came to Ephesus, uh, initially he taught in the synagogue, but when trouble arose in the synagogue, as it often did when Paul preached there, he was driven from the synagogue and he removed uh, himself and his followers to a, a place called the School of Tyrannius, and there he continued to teach for something like two years. Altogether, in, in retrospect, he spoke of his time in, in Ephesus as being three years long. He said that in Acts chapter 20 when he was recalling to the elders of Ephesus. This Now, <clears throat> what we're told in Acts chapter 19 is that while Paul was in Ephesus, in verse 10, it indicates that all of Asia heard the gospel. Now, Asia, again, would be the whole territory that we would call Turkey today, and Ephesus was simply one of its cities. But apparently from his base of operation in Ephesus, Paul would send out uh, friends, people that he assigned to go out to other cities and they would evangelize the other cities of Asia so that during the two or so years that Paul ministered in Ephesus, the rest of Asia heard through his messengers the gospel. Epaphras was no doubt one of those messengers and uh, Epaphras may have come to Ephesus on business and encountered Paul quite you know, coincidentally or he may have actually come to Ephesus because of hearing that some new gospel or new message was being preached there. We don't know what circumstance brought Ep uh, Epaphras and Paul together, but we do know that Epaphras was converted and became a missionary himself to his own hometown, which was Colossae, resulting in the planting of the church there, and Paul now writes to them. Uh, among the people that we know of who lived in Colossae, besides Epaphras, was Philemon, to whom the, the letter of Philemon was written, and his slave Onesimus, who is not only mentioned in the letter of Philemon, but is also mentioned in this epistle. Uh, because Paul, when he sent this epistle, sent it by the hand of one of his uh, associates named Tychicus and also Onesimus with him. It says so in Colossians 4, 7. Tychicus, who is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord, 
will tell you all the news about me. He says, I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. Now, Tychicus apparently was not one of them. He was not a Colossian. He was one of Paul's associates. But Onesimus was one of them. And we know the story of Onesimus from the book of Philemon, that Onesimus had been a slave of Philemon. Philemon had been converted. Uh, we do not know exactly how. Paul mentions to Philemon, in the letter to Philemon, you owe me your very life also, which has led many to believe that Paul himself evangelized and led Philemon to the Lord, and that he was appealing to this indebtedness that Philemon had to Paul uh, in asking him really to release his slave Onesimus and to treat him kindly. Uh, I'm not so sure that Paul led Philemon to the Lord. It would be a, a remarkable providence if two men who lived so far apart from where Paul was, both in Colossae, a slave and his owner, on separate occasions ran into Paul, one of them in Ephesus and one in, when he was in prison in Rome. I mean, God could work out those kinds of divine appointments, and he may have, but it's also possible that Paul did not personally lead Philemon to the Lord. When he says, you owe me your life also, it could certainly be because... Uh, Epaphras may have led Philemon to the Lord, and Paul had led Epaphras to the Lord, and certainly Paul would therefore be the spiritual grandfather, and it could as easily be said, uh, by way of Paul's desired argument, that you owe me your, your spiritual life too, even whether Paul personally led him to the Lord or whether one of Paul's converts did. In any case, <clears throat> we know that Philemon was not only a, a slave owner in the church there, the owner of Onesimus, but he was also um, the host of the church in Colossae. Uh, we see that in Philemon chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our brother, uh, excuse me, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, and to the beloved Aphia, who was apparently Philemon's wife, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Now, since Philemon, Aphia, and Archippus all apparently are in the same house, and then there's a church in their house. It is thought that Philemon and Aphia are a married couple, and Archippus may well be their son, uh, who is said to be a fellow soldier. Archippus is also mentioned later on in Colossians, where Paul says, uh, tell Archippus, in verse 17 of the last chapter, Colossians 4:17, Paul says, say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. So Archippus in Philemon is called fellow soldier in the faith, and in Colossians he's referred to as the one who needs to be exhorted to fulfill the ministry <coughs> which he's received in the Lord. So these names are the names of some of the Christians in Colossae. It's not clear whether the entire church met in Philemon's home. It's possible that the church was large enough to require more than one home, but we know that at least a portion of the church, if not the entire congregation, met in the home of Philemon. Now, what was the occasion of Paul writing this letter? It is almost certain that it was written at the same time as the letter to Philemon, partly because we find that Onesimus, whom Paul sends the letter of Philemon to accompany to Colossae, that is when Onesimus has, is a runaway slave, he's gotten saved, he has to go back and turn himself in, as it were, to the authorities, to his master. Paul wrote the letter to Philemon to sort of, uh, you know, lubricate his reentry into the city and make it a smooth <clears throat> return to his master. But we see also that Colossians is carried by Tychicus and Onesimus. So it seems clear that both letters were carried at the same time when Onesimus was returning to Colossae. And it may be that simply because Paul wanted to help uh, ease Onesimus's return to his master, that he, that he not only sent the letter to Philemon, but also felt, well, while I'm at it, I might as well write a letter to the whole church there. Uh, after all, I have a messenger here. Remember, in those days, they didn't have postal service. They didn't even have Pony Express. If you wanted to get your letter from one place to another, you had to find a traveler who happened to be on his way to that place and see if he'd deliver it for you. And all these letters of Paul were carried by somebody or another, usually a Christian who was traveling. The, the letter to the Romans, for example, was carried, uh, it would appear, by Phoebe. Uh, and there were other letters that were carried by other people. Tychicus probably made a special trip along with Onesimus. Onesimus was on his way home anyway. Tychicus may have had to accompany him because Onesimus was 
ostensibly carrying a letter from Paul asking his owner to be kind to him. But some might question whether Paul had really written the letter or whether Onesimus had come up with this in order to cover his own tail, as it were, and, and so Paul sending Tychicus along would be able to confirm that this was a genuine letter from Paul and so forth. I don't know if that's why Tychicus went along, but we would, could say that Paul may have just written Colossians as a general encouragement to the church and exhortation of the church that he took the occasion to write because he had a, a messenger going there anyway to carry the letter to Philemon. Most scholars believe, however, there was a, a more special reason for writing Colossians, and that is that there is concern for particular teachings that either had come or Paul felt were likely to come to the church which could undermine the gospel and which Paul hoped to uh, inoculate the Christians from. The nature of this teaching has been a matter of hot debate among scholars. We don't, we don't need to enter into all the details of that debate. I will simply acquaint you with it because almost anyone who writes an introduction, uh, even in your study Bibles, to Colossians is likely to mention what's usually called the Colossian heresy. And all the commentators talk about the, the Colossian heresy. Uh, we do not actually know for sure that there was a Colossian heresy, but based on certain things that Paul says to the Colossians uh, of a corrective sort, it is deduced that certain teachings were in Colossae which Paul wanted to address and wanted to correct. And these teachings were of a variety of types, not like the book of Galatians, which was very clearly written against Jewish legalism, or not like 1 John, which seems to have been written directly against Gnosticism, um, or some of these other books that have a, a very specific and obvious false teaching that they are trying to write against. Colossians has exhortations against a variety of, ki of things. And either there were just a variety of wrong teachings around that Paul wanted to address, or else there was an established religious system a heretical system that was trying to introduce itself which had all these elements. No one really knows for sure, but the scholars all seem to follow the idea that there was a Colossian heresy. Let me just point out to you <coughs> what the elements were that Paul wanted to correct. First of all, there apparently was a tendency toward Jewish legalism, perhaps even like that which was found in Galatia, although the elements of it are different in what he mentions here somewhat, but it's the same too. <coughs> in Colossians 2, in verse 11, Paul says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Now Paul is talking about a spiritual circumcision, the circumcision of the heart. And while it is not necessary to assume this, it is thought that perhaps he says this because there were some Judaizing types who were trying to impose physical circumcision on these Gentiles. Even as we know was happening in Galatia, some feel like Colossae may have been experiencing the same kind of thing. And that Paul is alluding to the fact that we don't need to be physically circumcised. We have received a circumcision which is made without hands, the circumcision of the heart. And by mention of the circumcision here in this way, it may be that he is trying to counter uh, a local teaching that was trying to require these people to have physical circumcision. We see a similar reason for mentioning spiritual circumcision back in Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, Paul said, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilators, or the mutilation. He's talking about circumcisers, people who are trying to enforce circumcision on the Christian Gentiles. He says, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, he's writing to Gentiles there at Philippi, and he says, we, himself, a Jewish Christian, and they, Gentile Christians combined, we're all circumcised in the, in the sense that matters. We don't need mutilators to come and physically circumcise us, although Paul, of course, as a Jew, had been circumcised, but he did not want his, his followers to feel that they must be. And... So he, in, in the course of trying to warn them against those that would impose circumcision on them, in Philippians chapter 3, he mentions we are the true circumcision. We have received the circumcision that counts, the spiritual circumcision. We rejoice in Christ Jesus. We put no confidence in the flesh. We, we, uh, uh, we worship at God in the spirit. This is spiritual circumcision. Likewise, he says in Colossians 2.11, 
in him you also were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, which would appear to be, although we could not be uh, emphatic on this point, an attempt to uh, diffuse any strength from, of argument that they needed to be physically circumcised. Now, if you look down in the same chapter, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16, Paul says, Therefore let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. Now, food and drink would probably almost certainly refer to the Jewish dietary restrictions. The reference to festivals and new moons, uh, there were many religions, including Judaism, that had festivals and observed new moons. The new moon was the first day of every month, uh, which was a holy day to the Jews, but also to some pagan groups. But the reference to Sabbaths, seems to make it very clear he's talking about Jewish festivals here. The Jewish laws about food and drink. The Jewish festivals of new moons and Sabbaths. So the combination of that verse with that in verse 11, the mention of circumcision, certainly indicates that there were some that either would or already were trying to impose Judaism or Jewish rituals upon the church. And Paul was telling him, don't let them. Don't let them do that. So we can see elements of Jewish legalism that Paul was concerned about here in the church. Then, also in chapter 2, in verses 21 through 23, actually we should probably uh, read verse 20 as well, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Now, there's a sense in which this too could refer to Juda Judaistic practices, but, I mean, the idea of don't touch this and don't taste that certainly has its counterpart in Judaism. You couldn't touch a dead body. You couldn't touch a woman uh, on her period. You couldn't touch a leper. You couldn't touch a number of things without being made unclean. Uh, and you couldn't eat certain things. You couldn't taste certain unclean foods. So we could here still have <coughs> excuse me, a reference to Jewish ordinances. However, in verse 22, he refers to them as the commandments and doctrines of men. Now, Judaism, with its regulations, certainly should not be called commandments and doctrines of men. Jesus did accuse the Pharisees of, at times, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men and teaching as orthodoxy Jewish traditions that were of human origin. And the Pharisees certainly did this. However, the, the do not touch this and do not handle that and do not taste this those were not ordinances made by man. Those were not Jewish traditions. Those were in the law of Moses itself. Therefore, since Paul refers to traditions of don't handle, don't eat, don't touch that, and he calls them the commandments and doctrines of men, he either must be saying that those Jewish ordinances, although they were commanded by God in the Old Testament, are not commanded by God now, and if someone commands you to do it now, that's a human teaching, not a divine teaching. <laughs> or else, as most scholars believe, he's not talking about the Jewish ordinances in this case at all, but rather to a form of asceticism, which the Greeks taught. I'm sure you've been told in uh, your studies of 1 John that the Gnostic heresy grew out of the Greek philosophy and taught that the physical matter is evil and spiritual things are good. And... Uh, this is basically what Plato taught. This is, this is just Greek philosophy, but it came into religion in the form of what was called Gnosticism. It was, a, it was a belief system or a philosophy that attached itself like a parasite to certain other religious groups like Judaism and Christianity. So you find Jewish Gnosticism in history and you find Christian Gnosticism. In Christianity, Gnosticism became a serious problem only in the second century, it became a full-blown system that the, many of the early church writers, Irenaeus and Tertullian and those guys, had, had to write against Gnosticism as a system. But we can see, for example, in 1 John, <coughs> that there was what we might call incipient Gnosticism or emerging Gnosticism, even in the days of the apostles. Now, the Gnostics, uh, coming from this Greek idea that matter is evil, had two different approaches 
to the physical body. Some Gnostics went one direction, some another. Some Gnostics taught that since the body is itself evil, and because physical matter is by nature of being physical evil and can in no sense be changed and cannot be improved, then any attempt to make it good is a, a fool's errand. It's a waste of energy. Uh, it'd be wiser and it would show better understanding of the spiritual nature of things to just let the body do whatever it wants and not care about trying to reform it since the body is uh, unalterably evil, being physical. And therefore, Epicureanism and other forms of simply narcissistic self-indulgence and physical indulgence was one reaction to Gnostic philosophy. So that people thought, some of them, that if the body is evil, and that can never change because it's physical, and that'll never change, and physical means evil, then what's the point of living under you know, self-control? Why try to make the body any better? It can't be made better. Might as well just let it have free reign and, and, and show our enlightened view of things because by, by not trying to reform the body, by not trying to restrain it, we show that we understand clearly this philosophical truth that the body is evil and can't be made anything else. This is what we might call, and, and has been called, and should be called, antinomianism. It's the, the idea that no law should restrict us, that we should just do whatever we want to do physically. And this led to, of course, tremendous uh, sensual sin, and it was one branch of Gnosticism. Another branch of Gnosticism came at the whole issue of the evilness of the body a totally different way. They felt that since the body is evil, the body should be more or less punished. Uh, because it is evil and because it exerts some uh, evil influence over behavior and over, even over the spiritual life, the body should be subjected by severe asceticism. Asceticism is where you actually deprive your senses of any pleasure for, for religious purposes. Now, there are many Christians throughout history who have been ascetics, not necessarily Gnostics, but ascetics, because Christians have often thought that the body is evil, and it is, it is difficult at times to arrive at a truly biblical view of the moral standing of the physical body, because on the one hand, the Bible does not teach that matter is evil. In fact, when God created the material world in Genesis chapter 1, after he made everything and it was all matter, he said, it is very good. And when he, before he made the physical body, he purposed himself to create a creature in his own likeness, in his own image, and therefore he formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into him the spirit of life. And, and God saw that he made everything very good. There's certainly no teaching in the Bible that matter is evil. As a matter of fact, it was this Greek belief that matter is evil that caused some of the Greek Christians to question the doctrine of the resurrection. And because uh, the resurrection teaches that our physical bodies be resurrected physical. And uh, many of the Greeks found that abhorrent. And Paul had to write, for example, 1 Corinthians 15 to a Greek church in Corinth where there were some, apparently, in the church who were doubting that the resurrection was a true doctrine of Christianity. And Paul wrote a whole chapter to refute that. But the idea that matter is evil is simply not taught in the Bible. God intends for us to live forever in material bodies that he will raise from the dead, according to Scripture. He made Adam and Eve in material bodies, and they were perfectly good as far as he was concerned. But the Bible does teach that sin has corrupted our natural state so that our body and its appetites become spiritual enemies in a sense that we have to suppress at times some of the desires of the flesh in order to be obedient to God. Now, that would mean, of course, that if I'm poor and hungry, and, I, and my neighbor is baking bread, and I'm tempted to steal that bread, that I have to put to death that appetite of my body. I have to not, I have to, I'm not allowed to steal. Stealing is wrong. Therefore, I have to suppress that appetite, or at least deny it. I have to deny my, the appetite of my flesh. Uh, another appetite of the flesh is, is in the area of sexual cravings. And there are certainly many situations in which there are sexual cravings which would be unlawful to fulfill. In fact, there's only a very limited situation in the Bible where sexual cravings are legitimate to fulfill. And in all other situations, they need to be suppressed. They need to be denied. You have to deny yourself. Now, some people, now, now that's just normal Christianity. Your body is not evil because of being physical, but it has, we are fallen creatures. And we tend towards selfishness and self-indulgence by nature. And our body has its demands that it makes, its cravings, its 
hormones, it's, it's lusts. And there's, actually the lusts are not in themselves evil because it's not wrong to eat food which your body craves at times. It's not wrong to drink water, which your body sometimes craves. It's not wrong to sleep, which your body sometimes craves. It's not wrong to be comfortable at times when your body craves it. And it's not wrong even to have sex in the right situation that God has created it for. These cravings are not themselves evil, but to live by these cravings is an evil thing to do because these, this body has to be brought under subjection, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9. He, he buffets his body. He keeps it under subjection. And, and so the body is simply a rival to the spirit. It's a, it's a servant, and it's good, but it also has its own desires. It, it is good insofar as its desires are kept within the perimeters of what God has ordained for them to be. The problem is the body doesn't know what those perimeters are. The spirit has to inform it and enforce it. Anyway, the Gnostics were certainly wrong to believe that the body is evil and must be punished Christians sometimes fall into that same trap. While it is true that we need to restrain the flesh from sinful behaviors, the Bible does not teach that we need to punish the flesh. And there have been monks and monastics of various kinds throughout history who were called flagellists, who took whips and whipped themselves. They'd whip their bodies. There have been people in other religions as well, in Hinduism and so forth, that sleep on a bed of nails, or in Islam that, that will make long pilgrimages crawling on their knees and you know until their knees bleed and there's uh, there are various religions including some that have stemmed out of christian roots some forms of monasticism that have believed in punishment of the body now that apparently is what paul is speaking against this kind of asceticism it's one thing to say we must discipline our bodies and keep it its uh, behaviors within the range of permitted things that god has ordained for it to do it's and that means we have to say no to our flesh on many occasions but that doesn't translate into a further step of saying and therefore we should necessarily deprive it even of lawful enjoyments because these enjoyments are evil and the more we can deprive our body of of those things the more spiritual we, we will be this is a step that's very easy for people to take uh, in their thinking but it is a wrong one and when Paul talks about these self-made, human-made regulations, touch not, taste not, handle not. Uh, he says in verse 23 there of chapter 2 of Colossians, these things have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body. So he's not just talking about eating kosher foods. Jews could remain entirely kosher and never neglect their body. They could eat sumptuously and still not eat pork. But he's talking here about rules that that are emphatically recommending the neglect of the body. It's uh, <clears throat> apparently like a Greek philosophy, perhaps even incipient Gnosticism here, uh, that was recommending ascetic practices. So you've got Jewish legalism. We've got evidence of that here. We've also got evidence, apparently, of Greek philosophy, possibly in the form of Gnosticism. Then also in chapter 2, in verse 18, there's a third strand to what's going on there. He says in, in Colossians 2.18, let no one defraud you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and the worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind. By the way, I should point out that that line, uh, things which he has not seen, the Alexandrian text leaves out the word not. So it would have something to do with a man talking about those things which he has seen. Scholars believe, in most cases, that what Paul is referring to here is some of the mystical practices of what are sometimes called the Oriental mystery religions. In, Ro in the Roman Empire, although Rome brought in its own set of gods and so forth, there were older Oriental religions, the, worth of, uh, the worship of Mithras and, and some other religions that had been there from the more ancient times, and were, they were not official religions, necessarily, like the Roman religion was, but, but they, were, they had their own little coteries of, of adherents who would go off and sort of, like, uh, mis sort of like a secret cults of sorts. And they had their secret rituals. And they were very mystical. And they, and they made claims to having visions and, and, and learning a great deal uh, about the spiritual realm from really occult kind of uh, 
experiences. And it is known that they worshipped angels. And therefore, when Paul talks here about being defrauded by those who would take delight in worshipping angels, and depending on the reading of that next line, intruding into those things which he has not seen, uh, some scholars would translate that uh, parading, the, uh, continually parading the things that he has, claims to have seen, really, uh, his visions and so forth, what he's learned by mystical revelation. That Paul is here seemingly addressing some of the elements known to be involved in Oriental mystery religions, which were separate from Greek philosophy and certainly separate from Judaism. Now, with these different elements, scholars have decided, and maybe wrongly, but maybe rightly, that there was probably a single heresy that some group of people were trying to, to teach to the Christians in Colossae. And they usually refer to this as the Colossian heresy. And that this, this heresy was sort of a, a conglomerate, an amalgamation of elements of Jewish legalism, and Greek or Gnostic philosophy, and uh, Oriental occult religion. You know, in a sense, if that is true, it would be very similar to what today is called what? We have a name for that today. It's called the New Age Movement. It's got elements of Christianity or Judaism. It's got certainly elements of Gnosticism, tremendously. It's almost a, a modern resurgence of Gnosticism in modern times. And it has its occult elements as well. And I'm not saying that what was taught in Colossae was identical to what is taught today in the New Age, but what, it, what appears to have been happening was a phenomenon called syncretism, which would be spelled S-Y-N, C-R-E-T-I-S-M, syncretism. And that is when elements of two or more religions are merged. Certainly the New Age movement today is an example of such syncretism. You've got elements of Christianity, but even more so elements of Hinduism and of, other, and of occultism. I mean, just kind of a, an amalgam of elements of different religions. That's what syncretism is. Or syncretism can also refer to the mixture of religion with, uh, let's say, Christianity with elements of your culture. Not necessarily religious elements, but maybe the values and beliefs of your culture. Uh, if they're mixed with Christianity, that is also syncretism. And many of the epistles show a concern, and even the Old Testament shows a concern that the people of God not fall into this syncretism of mixing what God has revealed with what man has dreamed up. The Pharisees' biggest problem was that they were syncretists. They basically took the law of Moses, which God had given, and the traditions of the rabbis, which were merely human speculations, and merged them together into one religious system, which is what Phariseeism was. And uh, in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, Moses warned the Jews when they go into Canaan not to inquire as to how these pagans worship their gods and to bring those practices, not to bring those practices into their worship of Jehovah. God has given adequate instructions and has given full information for us in the word of God as to how he wants us to follow him and worship him. And uh, he makes it very clear he does not want us uh, introducing foreign elements from the world or from other religions. And yet it would appear that the Colossians were perhaps being courted by some religious movement that had elements of Jewish legalism, Greek philosophy of a Gnostic sort, and uh, Oriental occult mysticism. Now, at least that's where the scholars stand on it. I have always wondered whether they're correct or not. There's certainly nothing here that says that all of these elements were in one group. There is at least an alternative idea that the, that the Colossians had, you know, they lived among Greek philosophers. They lived in, the, in a Greek, Greek or Roman world. And there were perhaps some Greek philosophers trying to, trying to influence them, trying to debate them on the matters of Christianity. And then over there, there were some Jews in the synagogue trying to Judaize them. And then over here, there were the mystery religions that are trying to evangelize them too. I mean, it's, it's possible from, from the evidence of Scripture that there were just these different religious groups in Colossae, and Paul is, in one chapter, mentioning all of them and saying, don't fall into that, and don't fall into that, and don't fall into that. Uh, so it's, uh, one theory is that, of course, they, all these elements were in one cult, in one heresy, 
call, and scholars call it the, the Colossian heresy. But the scholars could be wrong. These elements might not have all belonged to one religious movement. It might have been that there were several religious movements in town, and Paul wanted to one the believers against all of them. In any case, that's about all we need to say about the Colossian heresy. It is thought that because of this heresy intruding itself that Paul had to write this letter to protect the church. And, uh, of course, the other possibility is it was just a friendly letter written because Onesimus was going there anyway, and that Paul, knowing that there were Jews who would try to Judaize them and Greeks who would try to influence them and, and mystery religions that would try to proselytize them, just decided that he would make reference to these things and tell, tell them why not to do it. But the approach he takes, there are many things in the language he uses, which we, we would not recognize in the English, but there are special words in the Greek in this, in some places in Colossians, that are known to have been key words, especially in Gnosticism, and in some of the, uh, the claims of Gnosticism. And, and these key words are taken up by Paul and applied to Christ, not in order to enforce the Gnostic idea, but rather as the alternative to the Gnostic idea. Uh, in chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, It pleased the Father that in Christ all the fullness should dwell. And in chapter 2, verse 9, the same word fullness is found. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That word fullness, pleroma in the Greek, actually was used by the Gnostics to speak of the coming to the ultimate revelation of the, of the Gnosis and, uh, and coming to the highest level of spirituality that could be attained in the Gnostic uh, way. And that's one example where Paul uses language and applies it to Christ, which the Gnostics would use and, and apply it a different way. So some have felt that by using this word, what Paul is doing is trying to counter the Gnostics who would say, well, <clears throat> to come into the fullness, you have to go through these Gnostic levels of discipline and so forth. Whereas Paul saying, no, all of that fullness dwells in Jesus. And if you have Jesus, you are indeed complete in him. Uh, that's what he says in chapter 2, verse 10. You are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Now, the reference to principality and power <coughs> in Colossians 2.10, and also elsewhere, the principalities and powers are mentioned in Colossians 2.15, and even earlier in, in chapter 1, in verse 16, he mentions the principalities and powers. This expression, principalities and powers, is found quite a few times in Paul's writings, but especially in Colossians and Ephesians. Not only there, but mostly there. And principalities and powers, that's an expression that can be, unfortunately, can be taken more than one way. It can simply mean of earthly rulers, like the kings and the governors and so forth. In fact, Paul himself uses it that way without question. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 1, in Titus 3, 1, Paul says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities. In the Greek, it's the same two words, principalities and powers. The New King James doesn't render it principalities and powers because they know that in English we use those terms more often to speak of something else. But in the Greek, Paul is using the same terms here, principalities and powers. Be subject to the principalities and powers. Well, he's talking about the government officials, of course. He's not talking about anything spiritual. But elsewhere, in some places, Paul refers to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. For example, in Ephesians 3.10, Paul says, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Likewise, in Ephesians 6 and verse 12, Paul says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So when, when Paul attaches the expression in the heavenly places, as he sometimes does in Ephesians, to the term principalities and powers. He's not talking about earthly authority. He's talking about some kind of authorities in the heavenly realm. Either angels or demons or both. So this expression, principalities and powers, unfortunately is ambiguous. Sometimes it means earthly authorities. But it seems that more often...